welcome everybody to the RI seminar. Uh, we're really excited to have uh, Vlad Linton here. I was telling him earlier that uh, I put his name on the list a long time ago, and finally we got to his name on the queue, and it's like he is coming, and so uh, we're really excited to have him give a talk today. Um, Vlad Linton is right now a senior principal researcher and also the director of the Intelligent Systems Lab at Intel, um, and he's done a lot of work in intelligent systems, especially in the computer vision area, um, a lot of cool stuff that I think he'll be talking about today. Um, Vlad Lin got his PhD in 2002 um, in getting new results in theoretical computational geometry. He spent three years at UC Berkeley as a postdoc in the theory group, and then he joined the Stanford Computer Science as faculty in 2005 uh, as a theoretician. And now he joined or he joined Intel in 2015, and um, he's going to be talking about, I think, a lot of the recent work that he's been doing there. So we'd like to welcome you. Please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> wow, thank you so much. The room is utterly packed. I didn't <laughs> expect that. Uh, so I work in both perception and control. And people ask me sometimes, why is our understanding of control behind our understanding of perception? Why is our progress in perception seemingly more impressive and more rapid than our progress in control? And I think the difference is actually quite deep and quite structural. It's not a coincidence. It's not some uh, sociological arbitrary factor. It is due to structural differences between perception and control. A key difference is that perception systems can be trained discriminatively offline. You can think of it as in a passive fashion on labeled data. So you can take some images, label them with ground truth classes, and then keep your server hot with backpropagation and train an awesome image classifier. Okay, so it's basically up to your architecture, uh, architecture design and your optimization algorithm. But structurally, this is a very comfortable optimization uh, problem. You train on passive data, the data doesn't change under you, it doesn't move under you, it's static data with static labels. Even for detailed scene understanding problems like semantic segmentation, semantic instance segmentation, object detection, object detection and tracking, you collect data, you label the data, and off you go. You backpropagate through the model, you tune your model uh, to perform well on a test set. Furthermore, it is very clear to conduct community-wide research and to coordinate community-wide progress in perception because everybody can train on the same training sets and evaluate on the same test sets and thus get compatible numbers. So if I have an object detection data set, a standard object detection data set like Microsoft Coco, I get a number, let's say 78. Everybody understands what that number means. And if another lab in Shanghai gets another number, 82 percent uh, mean IOU on the Coco test set, everybody understands what that means our numbers are comparable. We understand that the Shanghai lab did something better than I did. They can push their code, I can get it, and my performance will get better. So we can bootstrap community-wide coordinated progress, which is what happened in perception. When the research on visual perception got onto a rigorous quantitative footing uh, in the early to mid-2000s, since then we've had coordinated community-wide progress, which is what's behind the massive rapid advances in uh, computer vision. Control, on the other hand, is different. To evaluate a control system, you have to deploy it in a living environment. And the performance of the control system depends on the environment's reactions to the control system. The system must act, the environment will react, and the choices that will be presented to the control system depend on how the environment reacted. So you cannot actually anticipate in advance exactly what the scenario will be. The scenario depends on the coupling between the system that you're feeling 
building and the environment that is reacting to the system and the system's actions when you change the system's actions a little bit when you field it it might go through a very different scenario and the scenario that my system my policy will go through when I field it outside this building will be different from the scenario that a similar seemingly similar system will go to uh, will go through in Shanghai when it's fielded by my colleagues in Shanghai. So it's actually hard uh, to conduct reproducible, perfectly controlled experiments. Between me and the, uh, and, the, and the team in Shanghai, we're going to get numbers, but the numbers are not necessarily going to be comparable. So it's actually hard to set up this coordinated, community-wide progress that we've seen uh, in, uh, in perception, okay? So uh, I think this is behind uh, some of the difficulties we're seeing in areas like autonomous driving. And this and other uh, factors are behind statements by Amnon Shashua, for example, the CEO of Mobili, that the driving policy that is actually driving the car is the hard problem in driving. I guess in retrospect it shouldn't be surprising that actually driving the car is the hard problem in driving, but that is not what people used to be saying. People used to be saying, well, you know, perceiving the scene is the hard problem, driving is the easy part, but I think uh, people are now realizing that actually driving the, ha the car is the heart of the problem and is pretty hard. And Amnon says that this is the Achilles heel of the entire industry. Now, there are other views on the situation in autonomous driving, and I will be focusing for the most part on autonomous driving in this talk, even though to me personally, the interesting problem is the coupling between perception and control, and how to set up intelligent systems that function in the physical world and operate in the physical world through time. I'm very interested in internal representations that systems must construct and maintain in order to function and accomplish goals in the physical world through time. To me, driving is simply a particularly interesting and practically relevant instantiation of the deeper, uh, of the deeper class of problems that I personally care about. So, focusing on driving, there is a different view on the current situation in uh, autonomous driving uh, expressed by Elon Musk last month. He said, I think probably by the end of next year, self-driving will encompass essentially all modes of driving I repeat, essentially all modes of driving and be at least 100 to 200 percent safer than a person. By the end of next year, we're talking maybe 18 months from now. Now, I can quite comfortably say that Mr. Musk is wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he is a smart person. Uh, I respect him, but smart people can also be wrong on specific issues, and I think this is one of those cases. To illustrate, let me show a mode of driving uh, that is clearly, by definition, is including in, included in all modes of driving. Okay, so here is a mode of driving that will be familiar to many of you, uh, many of you who have traveled, uh, uh, who have traveled the world. Now, by the way, this is not the world's worst intersection. This is common. You will see this. You know, if you go to India and other countries, you will see that this is quite common. Uh, moreover, what's particularly interesting, these are not the world's driving champions. These are regular people, just like you and I. And you would be fine if placed in this situation. You would go through this. This would not be the most stress-free day of your life, but you'd be fine, okay? But anyway, look, look, at, look at this guy. He's gonna attempt a U-turn right here, uh, okay? And what's amazing is that everybody just adapts. He's gonna go through just fine. Um, and again, you'd be fine too. Now, needless to say, we have nothing on the market that can do this. There is no driving policy that any company has that can, that can survive this, that can robustly go through this situation as reliably as a human, um, you know, not, not to mention 100 to 200 uh, percent better than a, than a human. We're just, we're just not there, okay? Now, I'm going to advocate simulation. Uh, as a tool or a set of tools that can help us get there. Uh, we need to be cautious in using uh, simulation judiciously and not getting 
overly enamored with simulation. There are dangers in using simulation, and I will talk about those two. But first, let me talk about the advantages of simulation. To me, the key advantages of simulation are in bridging the structural gap between perception and control. Okay? The big advantage of simulation is that you can set up reproducible experiments and you can train systems at scale, in parallel, sometimes faster than, uh, than real time in a data center. Okay? Now, this is not what you need for deployment. For deployment, you need to deploy in a physical system. You need to drive real cars in the real world. But in order to do that, you need to uh, experiment, on a, on experiment on a large scale. The thing is that we are still asking basic questions. We are still asking fundamental questions about the representation, about the architectures, the coupling of perception and control. Are we going to have end-to-end -end tuned systems? What is the role of modularity? What is the role of structure? What is the role of deep learning? Uh, we're still experimenting in a very broad design space. To do that, at scale, you need to set up controlled experiments and you need to set up community-wide progress as has happened in perception. To do that, I think simulation is incredibly useful. Furthermore, simulation can let us focus on the challenging cases in autonomous driving, for example, the rare challenging scenarios that would be hard or dangerous to stage in the physical world. So you can have a child running onto the road from behind a parked car 30 meters ahead of your car when you're driving 30 meters per second. Moreover, you can have a child running onto the road 35 meters ahead of your car, 40 meters ahead of your car, 25 meters ahead of your car, 20 meters ahead of your car. Child running onto the road in the rain, child, ro child running onto the road at dusk, child running onto the road at night, child walking onto the road, uh, child running onto the road at sunset when there is glare that is blinding the camera. Okay? You get the idea. You can set up an extensive suite of test scenarios and extensively test your policy and not just your policy. You can have a set of scenarios that are standard across the industry such that different groups and different companies use the same test suite and get compatible numbers. Once we get compatible numbers, once there is industry-wide agreement on the test suite of scenarios, we can start climbing the numbers. What happened in vision is that in the span of about a decade, we went from about 5 to 10 percent accuracy on the leading benchmark object detection data sets to more than 80 percent accuracy uh, on the leading benchmark data sets. That's the kind of community-wide progress that we want to uh, set up in driving policies and control more broadly. Now, simulation has been with us, as a historical note, from the early days of the field, and it's particularly pleasing to mention this paper here because this was work done at CMU. Uh, for those of you who are younger, who haven't read this paper, you should. This is amazing work by Dean Pomerleau here at CMU 30 years ago, okay? NIPS 1988, okay? Um, it's a very modern paper, if you read it now. He used simulated images uh, to train a neural network that, was, that, that then drove a real car. And here is, here is a car uh, okay, that is driving uh, based on a neural network that was trained on simulated images. Okay? So again, those of you who are younger, this is an amazing paper, an example of, uh, of, of, of a classic uh, that stands the test of time that, that you can do, by the way, more or less as, a, as, a, as, a, as an individual researcher. Okay? All right. Uh, a, a few more notes on simulation, okay, before, before I, I, I mention that we, uh, that we need to be skeptical about it. So simulation is also on a very nice uh, slope, a very nice uh, rate of improvement in realism. So here's Grand Theft Auto 1 when it came out 20 years ago. How cute. Uh, two years later, Grand Theft Auto 2. Some years, two years later, Grand Theft Auto 3, we went, we went 3D. Uh, some years after that, Grand Theft Auto 4. 
Five years after that and five years ago, Grand Theft Auto V. Now, you might not see that because of the lighting and the projector, but it's, this is really good. Uh, and that was five years ago, okay? So, and we're trending towards, uh, towards this, towards uh, this level of realism. So these images are not real. Uh, this is computer graphics. Now, this is not real-time computer graphics. It's offline computer graphics. But one thing we've learned in the field of computer graphics over the years is that once we achieve a certain level of realism in offline computer graphics, eventually that level of realism makes it into real-time computer graphics. And then, super real-time. Now, uh, this is the dose of skepticism. I feel like, like, uh, like, like I need to say this, even though it's, it should be kind of obvious and you should always keep it in the back of your mind. Don't get enamored with simulation. Simulation is a tool, not a goal. You are using simulation to deepen your understanding and to develop designs, architecture systems that must then function in the physical world. I completely agree with Rod Brooks. Uh, he has a way with words and so there's a beautiful phrase, simulations are doomed to succeed. Uh, okay, that also became a classic phrase in robotics. You need to remember, remember this. You can uh, you can optimize for results in simulation, you can tweak your systems, and the real sin is tweaking your simulator so that your system works, works better, okay? So simulators need to be tuned for reality, not for your system working well, okay? So there is a real kind of conflict of interest when you're building both the simulator and the system that is tested in the simulator, and you need to remain, uh, remain mindful, uh, mindful of that, okay? Having said that, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, for the structural uh, reasons that make uh, testing uh, and designing control systems purely in the physical world so hard, a number of large, incredible players in the industry are advocating simulation, particularly in autonomous driving, particularly to really understand, deepen our understanding of the issues around driving policies. So our friends at NVIDIA uh, like, uh, like simulation, uh, the path to billions of miles, and I completely agree, this is a great way of uh, putting it. This is Sasha Arnoux, director of engineering, at a talk a few months ago uh, where he said that they have uh, 25,000 cars running 24-7 in simulation at, uh, at Waymo. They've driven two and a half billion miles in simulation so far, and they are doing the kind of exhaustive rigorous testing that I have described, uh, described earlier. So this is several orders of magnitude more miles driven in simulation than they have driven physical miles. Now I will talk about a number of projects related to this area that we have done in our lab. We started with computer vision, visual perception, and using high fidelity simulation to create new sources of data and new benchmarks for visual perception. So I will just mention this because, because this is really cool. If you're interested in visual perception, I'd like you to know about this. This is one paper from a uh, sequence of works from our lab where we used Grand Theft Auto V, which is an amazing amazing virtual world that is, that is alive, it functions. Cars drive, people go about their business, people react to you when you, uh, when you interact with them. We used Grand Theft Auto V to collect a benchmark for visual perception. And because uh, this is in simulation, and we can get pixel accurate, dense ground truth data for pretty much any task that we can imagine, this benchmark is qualitatively different from other previously existing benchmarks for visual perception. What is different is that we have ground truth at video rate, so we have 250,000 HD video frames, so full video sequences, and we have ground truth for all tasks on every single frame at video rate. And we have ground truth for both low-level and high-level vision tasks. So low-level tasks like optical flow, visual odometry, object boundaries, 
high level tasks like semantic segmentation, semantic instance segmentation, 3D scene layout, object detection, uh, object detection and tracking, and so on and so forth. And it's incredibly diverse. Day, sunset, rain, snow, night, different environmental uh, conditions. And the ground truth is uh, incredibly high quality, pixel accurate uh, data. Okay, now having said this, from now on I'm going to focus on control because the main topic uh, for me today is control. The equivalent of this for control is a simulator because to test control policies you need a living environment in which your policy can act such that the environment reacts to your policy's actions. Okay, That is the difference between perception and control. For control, uh, we have built an autonomous driving simulator. We've also built other simulators, so we have an indoor navigation uh, data uh, simulator as well, but I will talk primarily about autonomous driving today. So our autonomous driving simulator is called uh, Carla. It is built on top of an open source, real-time game engine uh, called the Unreal Engine. In particular, we use Unreal Engine 4. What is amazing in this area is that the engines that are driving AAA games, the games that you go to the store and pay $50 uh, for the very leading highest fidelity uh, games that are released by, by blockbuster game studios, those same engines are available to you and I, to regular developers, open source. Okay, so the Unreal Engine is perhaps the leading um, uh, high fidelity game engine. It's used in leading uh, AAA games and you can also get it open source under a very liberal license that allows uh, research and, uh, and development in areas like autonomous driving. We created uh, custom assets, whole urban layouts, vehicles, street signs, vegetations, uh, uh, human models, and so forth. And we open source those. So they are available for free to the community. So without fear, you can do research on top of Carla. You can uh, develop something, redistribute it. The license uh, terms are uh, very liberal. And here, uh, everything is under your control. You can set up different sensors, plug in different sensor models. Uh, you can set up different sensor suites, experiment what happens when you have one forward-facing camera, a camera and a lighter, or three cameras, or 12 cameras uh, that, uh, that look at, uh, at a 360 field of view around, uh, around the car. And of course, you can all run controlled experiments. This is a fairly well engineered, fairly thoughtfully built uh, software, uh, software systems. This is a client server architecture. Uh, the server can, can run on, uh, on some servers. Uh, the client can run on, uh, on other machines. You can script the client via, uh, via Python. Uh, we have bridges to ROS, OpenAI Gym. You can deploy TensorFlow models. Uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, so it's really built and by now quite thoroughly tested for, uh, for a broad variety of, um, uh, of applications. So uh, there, are, there is a set of APIs associated with Carla that is growing. You, know, you can plug in custom vehicle dynamics models, uh, custom sensor models, custom sensor suites, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so con configurable sensor suite with a different set of sensors. All the assets were built by us and were open source so that you're not constrained by uh, licensing, uh, by various uh, licensing constraints associated with, uh, with various content that may be available commercially online. Um, the Unreal Engine comes with a whole ecosystem of plugins because it's such a leading 
uh, engine in computer graphics. There's a variety of physics simulation plugins. Uh, there are vehicle dynamics models. There are different weather plugins. There is a plugin that will make it rain. There will a there is a plugin that will make it rain and will create realistic puddles uh, on uh, on the roads, which uh, which you will see. Uh, different atmospheric scattering, uh, scattering models, different uh, camera models, and so on and so forth. And we're leveraging all of that, and all of that uh, can be leveraged in your work. Everything is open source. It was open sourced about a year ago. The GitHub page is a, is a, is a hive of, uh, of activity. Um, there's a ton of activity. You can see if you go to the GitHub page, people are talking about projects uh, they're working on. People are asking questions. And we have developers on staff who are continuously addressing issues and rolling out new functionality. Uh, so here's a little video trailer that the team made for uh, Carla 0.8. Okay, so we, uh, we had a new release recently. This happens every uh, every couple of months. There is a new uh, new release of this magnitude, and uh, the team got excited and prepared uh, a video uh, video trailer spontaneously and posted it. So uh, we have LiDAR uh, now. We have other new sensors. Uh, there's performance optimization, so it runs faster now. You get faster frame rate. And uh, um, you can also trade off graphics quality against frame rate. So you can have highly, highly realistic graphics, but of course it will run slower. Or you can have kind of simple, you know, 90s level graphics, but it will run three times, uh, three times higher, uh, higher frame rate. Uh, the development of Carla was originally funded by my lab, but more recently, because the project has been growing and has been getting so much attention, we are moving uh, towards more of a consortium model where multiple corporations are jointly funding the development and get a seat at the table so they can affect the, uh, the roadmap and influence the path of the development. So uh, the, first, uh, uh, the first additional corporation that joined the consortium is uh, Toyota Research Institute, TRI. So Carla is now jointly funded by Intel and uh, TRI, Toyota Research Institute, and we're inviting other players, uh, whoever is interested, who cares about autonomous driving and wants to contribute and affect the development of Carla, uh, can, uh, can join the consortium, sponsor the development, and also uh, influence the roadmap. Now, we've built Carla because there were experiments and there was, there was a type, type of controlled engineering that we wanted to conduct in autonomous driving that we just, we just couldn't, couldn't really do. There were experiments that we wanted to set up that we weren't able to set up. So when we built Carla, we finally got to run some fun experiments that we've been wanting to run for a long time. In particular, we, we compared a classic robotics driving pipeline, a modular pipeline uh, of the kind that you will be taught in a classic robotics course where there is a perception stack that builds uh, some intermediate representation, some model of the world. There's a planner that, uh, that lays out waypoints uh, based on that model. And then there is a low level PID controller that actuates the vehicle towards those, uh, those waypoints. Then there is an imitation learning, a deep network trained by imitation learning. I'll say a few more words on the kind of imitation learning that we use. And there is reinforcement learning, a deep network trained by reinforcement learning. You know that reinforcement learning has been, has been really hot, has been attracted a lot of attention. We wanted to see how well it does on, uh, on vision-based driving. So all of these policies act on a single uh, forward-facing camera. Okay, So this is a hard case, no lighter. Just, uh, just camera, uh, you know, the kind of driving that you would do uh, maybe if you close one eye so you don't think you have stereo. Uh, mostly stereo isn't really helping you when driving because the range is uh, much farther uh, than the range at which the baseline of your two eyes uh, really helps. So, um, a word in imitation learning. So the imitation learning that we used is actually a, uh, a formulation of imitation learning that also came out of our lab. 
uh, that will be presented uh, next month at ICRA. This is called conditional imitation learning. Uh, the key idea here is that you can continue to uh, uh, communicate with a policy trained by imitation learning after it's deployed. So when a policy is deployed, you can tell it turn right at the next intersection, turn left at the next intersection, go straight at the next intersection. High level navigational commands of the kind that you would get from a GPS device like Google Maps. Uh, so when you drive a car based on navigational instru instructions from Google Maps, Google Maps tells you at a high level what you need to do when there are major decisions that need to be made, but you're still controlling the car. It's still your job to look at the road, not hit anything, uh, not collide with obstacles, and, and actually drive the car properly. So that is precisely the job of the policy. The policy acts as a chauffeur that gets high-level navigation instructions and drives the car and we've tested this both in the physical world and in uh, in Carla so this is the the formulation of imitation learning that we're going uh, we're going to test here conditional imitation learning let me show you how these things drive I'll skip many technical details so this is the classic um, robotics modular pipeline it took a couple of months to set up it wasn't easy but it was set up it was tuned by the way uh, the Policies, all of them are going to ignore uh, signage like, you know, speed limits, red lights, things like that. They were just not trained uh, to pay attention uh, to pay attention to that. Turns out, you know, just driving and not hitting anything uh, was hard enough. Uh, <laughs> so this is imitation learning. It's also it's it's driving okay actually. Um, both the modular pipeline and imitation learning are uh, are okay. Uh, they survive. Uh, and you will see some numbers and we'll discuss some numbers uh, in a moment. You're now seeing the different uh, environmental conditions. So this is, this is a really nice time of day in, uh, in Carlos. So this is sunset and you see that it rained recently so there are these puddles. So that's nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So this was an earnest attempt uh, to get the best results possible from imitation learning, on, on, uh, from reinforcement learning on autonomous driving. This was done by a competent, experienced, motivated researcher who has gotten state-of-the-art results with reinforcement learning before. Okay, so this was not... Uh, <laughs> Yes, 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 uh, yes. So here are some numbers. Um, okay, there are four conditions. One is uh, you train in the same town and weather condition that you, uh, that you test on. But there's actually some generalization because you never go through exactly the same scenarios. The particular scenarios at test time and training time are actually uh, different. But the environment is the same. And then the rightmost uh, uh, block is everything is different. You're deployed in a new town and the weather is a kind of weather you, that you haven't even experienced during training. Okay, So there are a couple of interesting slices through this data. One interesting slice is the first row. The first row is a set of scenarios where your goal is to drive straight. Okay. Moreover, the street is empty. There are no pedestrians and, and no vehicles. Now, uh, this might come across as trivial, and it's trivial if you hard code the policy to drive straight, but actually, you know, learning to drive straight based on an array of pixels, if you kind of don't know in advance what the array of pixels means is non-trivial. Uh, think of it that way. Put uh, a chimpanzee uh, uh, at the driver's seat and, and train them to drive straight. It will take some time. It's not obvious. okay? Uh, or put a two-year-old at the wheel and have them drive straight. It will take them some time to figure it out. Okay? What is remarkable is that you know, pretty much no policy gets 100% accuracy. Uh, okay? And in the full generalization, uh, you know, you're seeing accuracies like 50, 50 to 80 percent. Okay, 80 percent means that one time out of five, when the job was to drive straight, the policy hit something. Okay, like veered off the road and hit something. So, so that tells you, you know, that just how hard driving is. Okay, based on raw, uh, raw sensory, uh, sensory input. 
The other interesting slice is the reinforcement learning column. Okay, so in the simplest scenarios where the, uh, the road is empty, there are no other cars or, um, or, uh, or pedestrians, you know, it gets non-trivial results, sometimes passable, driving straight, it, ev it eventually gets. But for complex scenarios, the, the two bottom lines, particularly the bottom most line is the kind of scenario that you saw in the videos where the car needs to traverse a non-trivial route with multiple turns and there are other cars and pedestrians on the road. In that set of scenarios, uh, the RL results are basically uh, trivial. It's just complete failure. Um, okay. Um, so you uh, need to take uh, the current hype around uh, RL with a healthy dose of uh, skepticism. Um, I've been working in the area for, uh, for years. There are very valuable ideas in, uh, in the area but it is very important uh, to remember that we're not there yet. Uh, deep RL is not some kind of magical panacea that solved, uh, solved AI and robotics. Most results in RL are obtained in simulation with dramatically simplified assumptions and they don't uh, map over to full-scale complex real-world tasks like autonomous uh, driving. I like Carla because Carla can really highlight uh, these issues and, and put that into fairly sharp uh, relief. There are a couple of lovely papers that I strongly recommend to anybody who's interested in uh, RL and, uh, and related problems. Uh, these papers uh, put the current state of the art in reinforcement learning in uh, context and uh, pour uh, some much needed cold water uh, on the hype. I think in the long term, uh, RL and related techniques are interesting and valuable. Um, I personally miss the days when there were a few of us working on, on, on RL and it was like a quiet esoteric topic and we felt like we're still getting a hang of the basics. Now we're still getting a hang of the basics but, all, but people are saying that we solved AI and RL is this huge, huge thing and, and, and every paper gets uh, gets a story in Wired uh, when it's posted on archive. Uh, I think that's a little bit uh, excessive. All right, for the rest of my time today, I'll talk about actually transferring uh, models from simulation to reality. Remember that I said that it's very important uh, to not just stay in simulation. So I will review two classes of techniques for transferring policies from simulation two physical robots that operate in the physical world. There are actually three classes of techniques. The first one, domain adaptation, is the one that's been explored the most. The largest number of relevant papers that have been published have taken the domain adaptation route. I will not talk about domain adaptation today. I want to focus on two other sets of techniques that uh, have gotten less exposure, uh, are a bit less known, but uh, I really, really like them. Okay, the first is domain randomization and the second is a recent approach uh, that we, uh, we have taken in a recent paper uh, that, I want to, uh, that I want to show you. Let's start with domain randomization. Okay? I first encountered the basic ideas in domain randomization in a project that we did with Alexei Dosovitsky where we built an agent that can play the game uh, Doom. And our agent ended up winning a competition, uh, the Visual Doom competition, where the agent was tested in a completely new environment, a new level that looked very different from Doom levels that were available to us during training. In fact, we didn't know in advance what the test level is going to look like. In order to prepare for this kind of generalization, for the agent functioning in a level that looks perhaps completely different, what Alexei did was every time in every training episode, he mapped completely random textures onto the walls and floor and, and ceiling of the level. So every time the agent was born in an environment that looks completely different and the environment looks, looked completely 
uh, wild. Elixay collected a library of on the order of 100 textures and just pasted textures randomly, randomly everywhere. The effect was that the agent became invariant to surface appearance. The agent basically at some point got really good at inferring the geometric layout of the environment no matter what the environment actually looked like, what the material properties were, what the surface appearance on the walls, the floor, the ceiling was. And we found in experiments that this was really key, that without this aggressive appearance randomization, uh, the agent did not generalize well to new, uh, new levels. Whereas with this appearance randomization, uh, the agent generalized to previously unseen textures, previously unseen, uh, unseen appearances. Independently, last year, Faresh de Sadeghi and Sergei Levin published a beautiful paper at RSS, and the subtitle of their paper was Real Single Image Flight Without a Single Real Image. What they did was train a drone flight policy in simulation and then deploy it on a physical drone in the physical world with zero fine tuning, and it flew, and it flew just fine. Okay? Now, when you're faced with a problem like that, your first intuition would be that I'm going to make my simulation as realistic as possible. I'm going to try to plug in you know, physics-based lighting and physics-based reflectance functions, and I'm going to scan real-world environments. They did none of that. What they did was train the, uh, the agent in wildly different, wacky, crazy environments, okay? Uh, the layout of the environments was, was reasonably realistic, but the surface appearance, they didn't go for realism. They went for crazy, okay? So that every time the agent is born in a, a, in a wacky looking environment, and every environment is different, okay? The effect is that when the agent is deployed in reality, Reality just looks like another crazy simulation, okay? Uh, so reality is a point in the space mapped out by the dimensions of variability that they vary here in simulation. So if they vary the lighting and uh, the material appearance and the reflectance and they vary it all crazily, maybe they don't need to know in advance what uh, the material appearance in reality is going to be. They just need to make uh, the controller invariant to the sources of variability, to the nuisance factors that, uh, that are then going to be encountered in reality. This is a very powerful idea because instead of needing to know in advance exactly how to model reality, you just need to model broadly the nuisance factors, what changes from simulation to reality, okay? Well, lighting is going to change, material properties are going to change, the detailed layout of the objects is going to change. Then you vary all those crazily and make the controller invariant to these factors. When it's invariant to these factors, it should do just fine in, uh, in reality without you knowing in advance what the values of these factors are going to be. The idea caught on and uh, it's been tested successfully a number of times in manual manipulation. So this is an image from a paper I really like uh, from Andy Davison's lab at Imperial College London. They trained uh, a policy in which uh, a robot arm finds a cube picks up the cube, lifts it, and drops it into a box, okay? And again, they just completely relinquished realism, okay? They went with these psychedelic, Berlin noise textures. None of these environments individually looks realistic. In fact, they all look cartoony and computer graphics-y. But there's aggressive randomization of uh, of everything, lighting, texture, uh, material appearance, uh, layout, and uh, uh, the controller is trained until it's successful in all of these uh, environments. Turns out, if you do this, if you completely give up on realism and you just go for crazy, uh, you get an incredibly robust uh, policy. So here it works in the real world, again, with uh, no fine tuning for the real world. It's just that the real world is in this 
space of appearances that they mapped out with their crazy psychedelic uh, setups. Okay, <laughs> and <laughs> it, it is really uh, it is really impressive. Uh, it is really uh, incredibly uh, incredibly robust. Okay, all right. So I wanted to uh, uh, to to show you this body of work because I think it's very stimulating and it provides a very creative uh, and counterintuitive uh, path for bridging the reality gap. Now. Uh, I will show you a different approach. Uh, this is an approach that, uh, that we uh, have tried recently in our lab, and it also yielded success. So, you know, you achieve uh, full tolerance by redundancy. So I'll give you more than one path to transferring from simulation to reality. This path actually takes a more classic route uh, and says, hey, what about modularity? Uh, you know, modularity is a very powerful idea. Uh, roboticists who have been building modular pipelines had some really good ideas. Uh, what if we learn from these ideas and integrate uh, deep learning with these modular architectures? Uh, what advantages would that have? And it turns out one major advantage is that we can transfer from simulation to uh, reality. So here is a driving policy that was trained purely in Carla and is now driving in the real world with no fine tuning, no retraining. The driving policy, the driving controller, was trained in simulation alone. Uh, moreover, I don't think it ever saw snow in simulation when the driving policy was trained, but it's driving in the snowy streets of Munich uh, in, uh, in the winter uh, just, uh, just fine. This is a 20% scale uh, truck that we've rigged up for, uh, for this sequence of, uh, uh, of, of papers. Now, the key idea is to encapsulate the policy so it doesn't touch the raw pixels and it doesn't touch the raw uh, low-level actuation of the vehicle. Okay? So, there is a perception module that ingests the raw image and produces a segmentation map. It's a binary drivable area uh, segmentation map. The policy acts on this segmentation map. Okay? Now, all we need now is for the perception module to work in both the real world and, uh, and simulation. The representation produced by the perception module abstracts away the difference between simulation and reality. So that the driving policy can just be trained based on the output of the perception, uh, of the perception module and it can be ju uh, just trained in simulation. Now, the perception module was trained on a real-world data set, uh, the cityscapes data set. And you might object, you might say, wait, you needed real data. But we needed real data in the different mode, in the perception mode, the mode in which we can train very comfortably in discriminative fashion with supervised training. It is the perception training mode that we understand very well that can be trained passively, offline, in a data center, training perception networks on supervised ground truth is what we're really, really good at. That is not the bottleneck for us. The bottleneck is training a controller that must act in a living environment. But that is precisely the part, now that we have a perception module, that is the part that can be trained purely in, uh, in simulation. So, we have a perception module trained on cityscapes. It produces segmentations. It can run in the real world and real data. It can run in Carla on simulated data. It gives you segmentation maps. The segmentation maps are quite poor. Uh, they're very noisy. Uh, they're really not great, okay? But that is the beautiful part about learning. We train uh, a driving policy with the real segmentation maps that uh, the, the perception module is running during training and is giving us real, per uh, real segmentation maps with their noise characteristics. So the driving policy learns to adapt to the imperfections, the noise characteristics of uh, the real perception system. Okay. 
On the other end, the low-level control is abstracted as well, so you can port, you can use the same driving policy with different vehicle dynamics models. So following classic robotics ideas, the uh, driving policy outputs waypoints, and there is a low-level PID controller that actuates the vehicle uh, towards uh, these waypoints. You can transfer the driving policy to different vehicles with different scales, different dynamics models, and all you need is to swap the uh, low-level controller in and out. The driving policy, the bulky part, uh, can stay the same. And again, that thing can be trained in simulation, uh, can, be, uh, can be trained uh, once, and then transferred. So let's see some more, uh, some more results. So this is the, um, the view from the vehicle, from the forward-facing camera. These are images, but remember that these are not the images that the driving policy acts on. The driving policy acts on segmentation maps. Now, this truck then flew um, thousands of kilometers to Saudi Arabia, um, the desert, where the weather is completely different, was unpacked, taken out of the box, put in the road, and drove, and drove just fine, okay? So, the same truck, same policy, no retraining, uh, same training in, in Carla, drove both in the snowy streets of Munich and uh, in, uh, in, in summary conditions in the desert. Here you see the segmentation map uh, from the front facing view. This is what the policy is driving, uh, driving based on, okay? So the segmentation map abstracts the differences between uh, simulation and the real world. So simulation and the real world differ primarily in terms of the appearance, the surface appearance. And that is the part that is abstracted by the intermediate representation provided by, uh, by the perception module. Um, so the segmentation map abstracts away the surface appearance and thus the difference between simulation and, uh, and the, physical, uh, the physical world. It drove in a variety of, uh, uh, of conditions, different times of day, um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so to summarize, uh, we talked about how control is structurally different uh, from perception. Our different rates of progress in perception and control are not a uh, coincidence. They are due to deep structural uh, differences. In particular, the ability to set up community-wide progress in perception based on controlled, repeatable experiments, standard test sets and standard experimental protocols, standard systems, standard scenarios. And uh, we talked about driving in particular and how actually driving the car is a particularly hard uh, problem. We talked about simulation and how simulation can help bridge this structural difference between perception and control and put us on a footing where as a whole community, as a worldwide research community, we can make progress on the hard uh, problem of control and in particular, driving the car. We talked about Carla as a, uh, a new open source platform that can be used as the basis for this community-wide infrastructure, and we reviewed different techniques uh, for bridging the reality gap, that is training driving policies in simulation and then deploying them in the physical world on real cars. Thank you very much. This one? Um, in, in this work, um, so I was wondering what the, what the uh, goal was. So the goal is just drive without hitting anything? Um, uh, so it's obeying, so it's the same conditional limitation learning setup where it's given high level navigational commands, the kinds of commands you would get from a GPS device. So when it approaches an intersection, uh, there is a high level GPS device uh, like uh, planner that tells it go left or go right. And it needs to obey the command 
and not hit anything. Yes, so it so needs to stay on the drivable area, not get onto the sidewalk, not hit anything, uh, and, and obey the command. And I was wondering, so actually after you did the um, segmentation, so I guess the segmentation is just trying to um, um, distinguish the roads and other uh, stuff, right? Correct. So the problem was after you did the segmentation, do you have uh, a baseline or a manually defined uh, policy that's kind of trivial, but use the segmentation to do the same stuff? Uh, that is, can we set up a classic uh, robotic robotics yeah. planner that takes the segmentation map and maybe kind of guesses the waypoints based on the segmentation yeah. map? Uh, we did not do that in this work, but it would be very uh, challenging without learning because look at these segmentation maps. They're really, they're really quite, uh, quite bad, right? So this is a real-time segmentation network that is running on board, okay, on this, uh, this vehicle, okay? So it's a super lightweight, super noisy, underpowered segmentation network. Um, it, it would be very hard to analytically uh, set up a very robust uh, driving policy based, uh, based on these segmentation maps. You're right that this is a natural baseline. It's probably something that we need to do, but if we do that, the next, the next natural question would, uh, would be, well, you know, did you do a great job? Maybe if my PhD students sat down and, 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 and set up an analytical driving policy based on your segmentation map, uh, my PhD student would have done better. So it, it's not completely clear what a convincing baseline here would, would be. But, but what other baseline did you use? Like we used different variants of uh, our approach. We did ablation, uh, ablation studies. Uh, one challenge in this area is that it's not like you can just download and you know an off-the-shelf driving stack, okay, and 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 uh, and and use it as a baseline. We couldn't find anything like that. We would have loved that for the Carla experiments, the modular pipeline. We wanted to get something off the shelf. I mean, the kinds of pipelines that Waymo and others are running now, they're not fundamentally new. Uh, structurally similar pipelines were running 10 years ago for the DARPA for the DARPA. DARPA uh, Grand Challenge and the DARPA Urban Challenge. But there is no open source code base that just says, okay, here is a Waymo-like driving pipeline. Uh, you know, uh, clone our repo and you'll have, you'll have a self-driving self system that you can use as a baseline. Unfortunately, there's, there's nothing like that that we could find. Thank you. Yes. Excellent, excellent work. Thank you. One thing that I was thinking from the planning and controls point of view, yeah. the way you set up your experiment, it's hard to distinguish when each approach struggle, whether it struggle because of perception. You're solving the hardest type of perception there can be. Mm -hmm. And then you're pairing it with different planning approaches. Yeah. What would the outcome have been if you use a laser or something that simplifies the perception part, and yeah. then you're focusing on evaluating the controls part? Yeah, so, so obviously uh, LiDAR uh, and, and, uh, and sensors like this can significantly simplify the problem. We try to go after kind of the hardest problem, as, uh, as you mentioned, we're very interested in that because somehow we feel like there's, you know, there's biological existence proof. Humans drive you know, ju uh, just fine. And, and we're, we're very interested in how that happens and can we reproduce that ability in artificial, in artificial systems. In Carla, you can now set up experiments where you drive based on ground truth depth or you drive based on simulated LiDAR. And I agree, that makes the problem easier. But you don't know what the result would have been in comparing the traditional pipeline uh, imitation learning and reinforcement learning? No, uh, we didn't set that up. Those experiments are pretty, pretty labor, labor intensive. So setting up these pipelines, uh, tuning them, like tuning the modular pipeline, that took time. Yeah. Yes, Chris. So I'm somehow totally missing the message. Okay. Slide, the last part of the talk. Yes. Part of my problem is I sit there and I watch this toy car run yes. to the gutter repeatedly in Saudi Arabia. Yes. And doesn't do a particularly good job avoiding the higher piles of snow. So I think yes. that test is totally misleading. 
No. <laughs> you're, you're looking there and you're saying, is there space for a toy car? Sure, let's go to the right. If you had yes. done this test with a real size car, you would have yes. probably gotten completely different results. So, yes. so that, that's problem number one. Yes. Problem number two is you're saying, okay, I'm training one net and then I'm using it to train another net. Yeah. Practically everybody in the business does that. We all thank God that Alex trained his net so that we could reuse it. Okay. That's what everybody does. So Good. what exactly are you advocating? Okay. So we're still in kindergarten. Okay. We're like little kids who are excited that we could train a driving policy in simulation and then field it in, re in a real vehicle and the result was not a disaster. Now, you might look at this and this looks like a disaster to you, but that is because they didn't show you what the other policies do. Okay? The other policies don't even get, you know, to the gutter. The other policies veer off and hit the building, hit the street lamp, don't get started. When they're told to turn right, they go straight. The other policies are much worse. The non-trivial level of performance that you see uh, in this video is due to the training in simulation. So, there are a couple of points. First, if you think this level of performance is trivial, I take issue with that. I think that is wrong. If you think that level of performance is bad compared to what we need to actually drive on a commercial scale, I completely agree. We're still in, in kindergarten. We're excited about baby steps. And the baby step we're excited about here is that we could train something in simulation deploy it in the real world and get a result that is non-trivial, okay? That is, that is not obvious that you can do that, okay? That took time and there were many skeptics. Many people were saying, well, you know, simulation is, you know, doomed because once you're in simulation, you will not be able to transfer to reality. The fact that you can do that, uh, you know, that's, uh, that, 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 that is exciting. And that's how you make progress in research. You take baby, baby steps, okay? The grasping and, you know, manipulation policies, these are also baby steps compared to what you would need to, you know, industrial scale deployment in, in, in warehouses and truck box unloading. These are also baby steps. Everything is in the lab. You could say, well, that's, that's terrible. And you haven't even seen the bloopers. Uh, okay? So yes, baby steps. <laughs> yes, Chris. This is too much fun. Yes. There is something very weird about the numbers you presented when you compared ML and RL. ML, uh, uh -huh. the, the standard robot thing got better when you put it in crappy weather. Uh, yeah, uh, so some of the weather conditions in the test set are easier uh, than uh, some of the weather conditions in uh, the training set. So there's some arbitrariness there. Essentially, it's not just generalizing to new weather that's hard. Some of the weather conditions are intrinsically harder than others. So if you have heavy fog, that is harder. What happened, we also wondered after we looked at these results, what happened? What happened is just by randomly partitioning the set of weathers, uh, some hard weathers ended up in the training set, like you know, heavy fog or sunset with a wet road with glare. And, uh, and the, uh, the test weathers were comparably a little bit easier in aggregate. So you see, uh, you see this kind of discrepancy. So we're kind of hitting the time limit. So I'm gonna take one question from Katya, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll, uh, Vlad will still be here, so you can ask him a question afterwards, but since we've got it fast, we'll take one more question. <laughs> yes, so, so uh, do you have in the simulator, you simulate the slippage, the traction, and so on, because in Munich and snow, I mean, this is one of the, so vision is not the problem when I drive in snow. It's, it's not. The, the control. Uh, yeah, the PID controller was uh, was basically tuned by hand, and the PID controller was was trained to drive uh, okay. to drive there. Okay, because yeah. of course driving in a dry thing is much easier. Right? Yeah. Okay, so you hand train, you hand tune the PID the low level controller. controller. Yeah. Yeah. Let's give a hand. Thank you.